So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Jilalongkorn University Language Institute International Research Webinar 2020. In celebration of Jilalongkorn University Language Institute's 43rd anniversary, the theme of the webinar this year is Exploring the Changing Frontiers of ELT Research. Our research department organizes an annual conference around this time, around July every year, free of charge. And this year is quite special because um, we do it online. This is the second session of the webinar series. And welcome back for those of you who listened to the talk this morning. Um, for this afternoon session, it will be about a teaching approach, something different. Let me introduce our speaker today, okay? Dr. Rod Ellis, is currently a professor in the School of Education, Kern University in Perth, Australia. He is a world-renowned leader in the field of second language acquisition. He has taught in England, Japan, the US, Zambia, and New Zealand. He is the author of the Oxford University Press Duke of Edinburgh award-winning classic, The Study of Second Language Acquisition as well as many other books as well. Um, I remember I read your book, The Task-Based Learn Language Learning and Teaching, the uh, light blue book, and I used mm -hmm. that in my research as well. So many of um, his books have become core textbooks in TESOL and linguistics programs around the world. We are honored to have him here with us today, virtually giving a talk entitled Task-Based Language Teaching, Where It Has Come From and Where It Is Going. And after the talk, we will have a Q&A session. You may leave your questions in the group chat and then Dr. Ellis will answer them for you after his talk. Without much further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Rod Ellis. Over to you. Okay, uh, thank you for coming to my webinar. Um, I must admit, I would much rather be physically with you so that I could see you when I am talking. Um, it's actually quite difficult giving a talk when you can't really see how people are reacting, but I'm going to do my best. You can see that my talk is called Task-Based Language Teaching. Where did it start? And oh dear, there's a spelling mistake. Where is it going? Um, the talk is really in two parts. First of all, I want to do a quick sort of historical survey of task-based language teaching. And then in the final part, I want to conclude with a number of issues which um, really still need researching uh, because they are undecided. Okay. This is my first slide, and as you can see, it really just provides you with a definition of what task-based language teaching is. I'm sure that many of you already know, but I thought it important to start off with a clear statement. I want to highlight a number of points in this definition. Uh, it says the importance of engaging learners' natural abilities for acquiring, acquiring language incidentally. What we know from research is that everybody has the ability to, to acquire a language, a second language, naturally, without having to study it, simply by being exposed to it and by understanding eventually what's said and then actually beginning to try to speak it, etc. So when people are acquiring a language incidentally, using their natural abilities, they treat language as a meaning-making tool. In other words, they are not concerned with trying to understand the grammar, or memorize words, they are simply trying to use it as a meaning-making tool, much as you might use your own first language. And clearly, task-based language teaching contrasts with what have been the mainstream traditional approaches to language teaching. 
which tend to emphasize intentional learning and deliberate attempts to actually learn, rather than learning through exposure and learning through interaction. Okay, so now we can start my historical review. And these are the starting points. Actually, task-based language teaching really derived from communicative language teaching. It was really a development of communicative language teaching. And to show you why, I pointed to two key ideas in communicative language teaching. What is called the deep end strategy, which dates back to Keith Johnston. And then Howard, in his history of English language teaching, the distinction that he made between weak and strong versions of CLT. The deep end strategy means that instead of starting by trying to teach learners some specific grammatical rule or specific vocabulary, the starting point would be to get them to perform some kind of communicative task. And only if you then see that they can't perform the task that they are using bad grammar, that they do not know key words, only then, after they've had a try at doing the task, do you actually um, engage in direct teaching. Weak and strong versions of CLT. The, the weak version of CLT basically means you decide what you want to teach. You teach it explicitly, you practice it, and then at the end, you give people a task to give them the opportunity to try to communicate using what you have taught them. And the strong version of CLT is really the same as the deep end strategy. Instead of ending up with the task to practice what you taught, you start with a task. So you can see that if you like strong versions of com communicative language teaching, uh, were the origin of task-based language teaching. There was a, another source of information that fed into the development of uh, task-based language teaching, and that was second language acquisition research. And you can see two pictures here. I'm not sure that you know who they are. My guess is that you're more likely to know this one. Do you? This is Stephen Krashen. And this one, who in many ways I think is even more influential, is Pitt Corder, um, who many people think is the father of second language acquisition. And you can see here some of the key ideas. Corder suggested that learners have a built-in syllabus. They have their own way of acquiring the language. Krashen made a distinction between acquisition, which is the incidental, learning through natural exposure, natural attempts to use the language, versus learning, which is intentional learning. And the natural approach is the approach that Krashen developed with Terrell, which in many respects has many of the elements of task-based language teaching. Okay, so I've just given you the background to it. So now we can come to some early TBLT proposals. And um, we must start with Michael Long, because Michael Long was really the first person to come along and make a, a, a coherent proposal for using tasks in task-based language teaching. Long drew on research in second language acquisition, and his basic idea was that there's no reason to assume that presenting the target language as a series of discrete linguistic or sociolinguistic teaching points is the best or even a way to get learners to synthesize the parts into a coherent whole. So what's he saying? What he's saying is that he doesn't think that the direct teaching of language, if you like the weak communicative language teaching approach, he doesn't think that that is compatible with how people actually learn and with what second language acquisition research shows. 
And so we put forward uh, a different approach based on tasks, which he considered an integrated solution to both syllabus and methodological issues. In other words, the notion of task, according to Long, brings together the idea of what we're going to teach, syllabus, with how we're going to teach it, methodology. Two other very influential people in developing task-based language teaching are Candlin and Breen. Um, Candlin's view was that task-based language teaching um, had a lot to recommend it from an educational perspective. Look at what you can see, helping people to become aware of their own personalities, fostering self-realization and self-fulfillment, enhancing self-confidence. So his arguments were sort of more to do with the educational value of task-based language teaching, uh, together with it, the motivational value. And Breen actually went a step further and said that really we shouldn't predetermine syllabuses for learners, we should negotiate syllabuses with them. And his idea of negotiating syllabuses was again to center the syllabus around task. In other words, to identify the kinds of tasks that learners thought would be useful for them and that they would want to do. The first real attempt to implement task-based language teaching took place in India under the auspices of um, Prabhu. And you can see his book there, Second Language Pedagogy. And this provides really a very excellent account of his particular project. And what motivated his idea was again, that we shouldn't really be trying to teach grammar bit by bit. What we should be doing is creating the conditions under which learners can learn grammar naturally. And again, he thought that this could be best done by involving learners in a whole series of tasks. Again, I'm pretty certain everybody knows him, um, David Noonan. And Noonan in 1989 wrote one of the first complete books about task-based language teaching. And um, he, he intended it not really as a theoretical account, but as a, a, a practical set of proposals for how teachers could design and use tasks. And interestingly, Noonan did not entirely dismiss traditional syllabuses, grammar-based syllabuses. He thought they did have a role, but he didn't think that all teaching should be based on a grammar-based syllabus. He said the, the, the grammar syllabus should function as a checklist so that while learners are busy doing tasks, teacher can monitor their progress. And if they see that there are some grammatical structures that they're still using incorrectly or not using at all, then maybe there would be a case to actually direct, directly teach that particular grammatical structure. So it's a kind of compromise. And it's actually a compromise that uh, I support fully because my later views about task-based language teaching also argue for the idea of a modular approach. One module would be purely task-based and the other model, module would be grammar-based. And the idea again would be that the grammar would simply function as a checklist. Now, if, if teachers are going to understand what task-based language teaching is, then it's quite crucial that they have a clear idea of what a task is. And actually not just what a task is, but also what it isn't. And the early uh, commentaries about task-based language teaching did provide definitions. And you, I've given two definitions here, the one by Long and the one by Noonan. Quite different actually. Long really says that tasks are the 101 things that people do in everyday life, at work, at play, etc. Uh, in other words, 
he was interested in authenticity. He said the starting point should be to actually describe the tasks that people do, and that should provide the basis for teaching. Newnan wasn't really concerned with the art of trying to identify the tasks that people need to do. Um, he simply said that we must make sure that a task is primarily a meaning-based activity, right? For him, any, any activity that was made meaning-making central was um, a task. Not only did people start to try to define tasks, they also tried to set about classifying tasks. And uh, following on from Long's definition, Long really um, talked about target tasks, which are the real life tasks that people do, such as selling an airline ticket or buying an airline ticket. And then he said, maybe we can create task types. So just as you can have buying an airline ticket, you might have buying a cinema ticket, buying a bus ticket, um, etc. And that these would constitute task types, buying some kind of ticket. And then he said that when you've settled on the task types, then you need to convert the task types into pedagogic tasks. And these are the actual tasks that students would work with. Although he did not, in his early work, give any clear indication about how you move from task types to pedagogic tasks. Prabhu identified three kinds of tasks. Information gap, which is where there has to be an exchange of information. Reasoning, where people have a problem and they have to reason what is the best solution to that problem. And opinion gap, where people have the opportunity to share opinions about something. Classifying tasks. If one is going to have a task-based syllabus, clearly we need to define tasks, we need to classify tasks, we need to select tasks, and then we need to grade and sequence the tasks. The whole idea of a syllabus is it's not just a list. It's a statement about what you should do first, what you should grappled with was how to grade and how to sequence tasks. And these are some of the very early suggestions. And you can see that maybe these suggestions are helpful, but they don't really give a very precise idea about how to grade and sequence tasks. That came a little later. So now we are on to subsequent developments from this early beginning. How did task-based language teaching evolve? So we've really re reached the, the 1990s now, the middle of the 1990s. Uh, one major development was the broadening of rationale for tasks. We've seen that primarily the, uh, people who were promoting task-based language teaching drew theoretically on second language acquisition research. And what some researchers now began to do was to draw on educational research. Uh, Smooder and Bygate produced a very good book in 2008 about task-based language teaching. And they started off there in the first chapter in that book sketching out the educational case for task-based language teaching. And they drew in particularly on Dewey, uh, a famous uh, educator. And what Dewey emphasized was um, that one needed to draw on learners' experience and help them to connect what they are learning with the real world. Work also took place on defining tasks. And this is where I actually like to bring myself in uh, because um, I developed in, in my 2003 book and a little bit before that in some publications, I developed what I thought is a much more precise definition of task. First of all, I said that 
when we're thinking about tasks, we need to think about work plan and we need to think of task as process, what happens when the task is done, right? And I argue that when we're defining tasks, we can only define a task in terms of the work plan. Why? Because it's not really possible to completely predict how a task will be performed. So we don't really know what the task as process is going to be. So if we don't know what it's going to be, we can't possibly define tasks that way. And I ended up with suggesting that there are four criteria that must be satisfied for an activity to be a task. The first is that there must be a primary focus on meaning. Remember what Newman said, I picked up on what he said. There must be some kind of gap. It's the gap that creates the motivation for communicating. And I drew on Prabhu here with the idea of the uh, uh, information gap, reasoning gap, opinion gap. The third one is my own addition. And I think this is a very important one. That when learners are doing a task, they have to draw on their own linguistic resources and non-linguistic resources. In other words, they have to make do with whatever language they have in order to do the task. And I put this criterion in because I wanted to stop the idea that we could sort of teach people some language and then give them a task to practice that language. That's not task-based language teaching, that's traditional teaching. So that's a very important one. Uh, and finally, there must be some kind of communicative outcome. As a result of doing the task, um, we must know what the communicative outcome was. One of my favorite tasks that I often use to illustrate task-based language teaching is the map task. And this is a listening task. Um, students have a map and I tell them where various places are on the map and they have to write in the names of the places on the map. So the communicative outcome is very clear there. The communicative outcome is the map that they have made with the names of the places on it. That's my definition of a task. Work also took place on classifying tasks and we now have uh, different ways of classifying tasks, different ways of thinking about tasks. Willis, in what is one of the best known books on task-based language teaching, published in 1996, uh, she, she provides what I call a pedagogic classification. Um, uh, and by this I mean that she simply tells us what kinds of operations, what kinds of things students have to do in order to achieve the communicative outcome of a task. Listing, ordering in sequence, sequencing, problem solving, sharing personal experiences, etc. So that is one useful way of classifying tasks uh, and very useful for teachers. Psycholinguistic classification came into being when people began to research how learners perform tasks and what task characteristics influence the way in which they perform the task. In particular, researchers were interested in the negotiation of meaning. Um, negotiation of meaning takes place when there's some kind of breakdown. And the theory argues that engaging learners in negotiation of meaning is going to enhance their opportunities for learning incidentally, naturally. And this led to things like one-way versus two-way tasks, open versus composed tasks, convergent versus divergent. The next distinction you can see there is to my mind a quite crucial one, and that is that we can classify tasks in terms of whether they um, are situationally authentic. That is to say, they correspond to tasks that occur in real life. Or do the tasks just have interactional authenticity? 
That is to say, they result in the types of interaction that might occur, but the actual task itself is not situationally authentic. I think that's important because one question that teachers have to ask is should I go for situationally relevant tasks or is it okay to simply go for interactional authenticity? The next distinction is also very important, input-based versus output-based. Input-based are tasks that involve listening or reading, but no production on the part of the learner, no reading, no speaking. Output-based tasks are tasks that involve production. This is important because if we're going to use task-based language teaching with learners who have very low proficiency in English, um, or even learners who are complete beginners, clearly we can't use output-based tasks. You can't expect learners to start producing immediately. They have to spend time learning the language incidentally, naturally. And how do they do that? They do that through input-based tasks. So the map task that I mentioned a moment ago is an example of an input-based task. The final distinction is focused and unfocused. And this again is a distinction that I have made in my 2003 book. A focused task is a task that has been designed to try to get learners to use some particular grammatical structure, like say present perfect. So you design a task, you don't tell them that the task is there to get them to use present perfect. The idea is that the task will naturally lead them into using present perfect. Unfocused tasks are tasks that have no grammar focus at all. So these are some different types of tasks that uh, people are researching and that um, teacher educators are now trying to use to develop models of task-based language teaching. Task selection also becomes a crucial thing. As we have seen, Long argues that, tasks, uh, that a task-based language course should be needs-based. He says the starting point is to actually find out what are the target tasks, the or, or situationally authentic target tasks that students have to need to do. And he said that should form the basis for the development of a course. The problem there, of course, is that this doesn't work very well, particularly in a lot of EFL situations. Because in a lot of EFL situations, the students don't really have any target needs. They don't have any need to use English outside the classroom. And thus, you could say that for many learners in Asia, um, the approach that Long is suggesting is not actually going to be relevant. Of course, it would be relevant if you have any specific purpose courses, then yes long is the way to go. But otherwise, if you're looking at, say, school learners, in particular elementary school learners, I think it's impossible to actually do a needs analysis. I don't know how familiar you are with um, Peter Robinson. Um, I've given you a little picture here. But his major contribution to task-based language teaching is to um, offer um, a whole set of factors factors that influence task complexity, then we're in a position to grade and sequence tasks in a syllabus. And that was what his major contribution is. Uh, I'm not going to go over his particular framework. It would take too long in the time I have available, but it was definitely a step forward. You will notice that so far I've been talking about tasks and task-based syllabuses, and I haven't actually talked much about the task-based lesson. 
And that's because initially there wasn't much discussion of the task based lesson. But later on, a lot of, a lot of uh, attention was paid to what the task based lesson should consist of. Uh, in the communicational language project, Prabhu's project, um, Prabhu had a very, very simple way. He said there would be a pre task, which was actually a task in its own right. And it would be done by the teacher and all the students, the teacher working with the students. And then after that, there would be a second task, the post task. And this is where students did the post task individually. So Prabhu's idea of a task based lesson is extremely simple. A pre task teacher does it with the students and then a very similar task, which students do by themselves. Uh, Jane Willis um, offered a somewhat different structure. She, she suggested that there are three major parts to a task-based lesson. There's the pre-task, where the teacher introduces the topic and the task to the students, uh, prepares them, motivates them to do the task. Then there's the task cycle, and that has three parts to it. First of all, they do a task and then they plan their report. They're going to make a report to the whole class on what they found as a result of doing the task. And then they make the report. And then finally, there's a post task stage. And this can involve more traditional type language teaching, more language analysis and practice. Another important methodological principle of task-based language teaching is focus on form. Uh, and this term again comes from Michael Long. Um, you can see here that I've given Willis's view about focus on form and Long's view about focus on form. First, let me make it clear what focus on form is. Focus on form is not what you do before students start to do the task. Focus on form is what you do while students are performing a task. It's online focus on form, if you like. Willis didn't like the idea of doing any kind of focus on form while students were doing the task. But Long argued that this was in fact quite essential. Long's view is this. He said that if you just give learners tasks to do, they will develop communicative strategies that enable them to do the tasks fairly well, but they will not need to pay much attention to actual language. And because they don't pay much attention to actual language while they're doing the tasks, then they will not acquire the language. So he suggests that what we need to do is to draw their attention to certain points of language while they're doing the task. And one very clear way of doing this was through corrective feedback. Okay, I now want to move on to show very, very quickly some of the developments of TBLT. First of all, technology media, a TBLT. Um, the developments, first of all, uh, computer-assisted language learning, uh, developments in Cal mirrored those in language pedagogy in general. That's to say there was a structural behaviorist phrase, this gave way to a communicative phase, right? And finally, to uh, an approach that is much more task-based. So the developments that have taken place of call mirror the developments that have taken place over language teaching from an, uh, a period in the 60s and 70s where there was a focus on drill and practice to the uh, 1980s where communicative language teaching began to make inroads and then finally to task-based language teaching. And we can see the same pattern in call. Technology has many advantages for TBLT. 
Perhaps the biggest one is the first one that I mentioned there, that it affords multimodal opportunities for presenting complete, complex and complete work plans. In other words, if, you have, if you're using technology to present your task, then you can present oral information, written information, visual information, etc. Uh, and also, of course, um, there's the possibility of performing tasks synchronously with students or asynchronously. They have a go at doing it and then you can comment afterwards, etc. Technology makes tasks with complex outcomes possible. So you can have rich, multi-layered input. What we know from second language acquisition research is the importance of input. And perhaps one of the weaknesses of paper-based, task-based language teaching, is there is an insufficient input. But in technological TBLT, there's the possibility of providing people with massive amounts of input to, for doing a task. Ortega, I think, came up with a very good suggestion, and that is that um, maybe what we should do is to link tasks together into a project. In other words, we start by deciding the basic parameters of a project, and then we work out the different tasks that learners need to do in order to finish the project. A few words also about task-based language assessment. Um, there's not much sense really on embarking on task-based language teaching if the type of assessment is still going to be very language-centered, very traditional. Um, why that's not a good idea is because if students know that the assessment is very language-centered, very traditional, they will find it very difficult to accept that they should not be doing, that they should not receive instruction that was directly preparing them for that kind of examination. So this means really that Testing in task-based language teaching needs to be itself task-based. The assessments must consist of getting students to do tasks. And you can see here, I suggest two ways in which tasks can be assessed. One is simply in terms of the results from performing the task. In other words, do the students um, we need to look at the language that they use when they're performing a task and we need to assess and evaluate the language that they are producing. This in fact is what happens in performance-based language testing. You could argue, for example, that IELTS in uh, its writing and speaking parts uh, actually involves tasks and asks an assessor to assess the language that learners are producing orally or in writing uh, while, uh, uh, when they did the task. The second way of assessing a task though is perhaps more interesting and more practical for teachers. And that is that maybe we can assess a task entirely in terms of whether students have achieved the outcome or not, the communicative outcome. Uh, think of my map task a moment ago. Um, students have a map, um, they listen to uh, descriptions of where different places are on the map and they have to write them on the map. So an easy way of assessing them would be to look at the map that they have drawn and see whether they put the places, uh, all the different locations, the names of the places correctly on the map. Um, so all we need to do would be to count up whether they've got all the place names correctly located, um, or maybe only some of them, and give them a mark out of the number of correctly located places. So task-based language assessment. In any curriculum, 
we also need to go to the final stage of curriculum development, which is evaluating task-based language teaching. And there have been a number of attempts to carry out evaluations of task-based language teaching. Beretta and Davis evaluated Prabhu's communicational language teaching project. Carlos evaluated the introduction of TBLT into elementary schools in Hong Kong. And Gonzale Lore and Nielsen evaluated a specific purpose TBLT course for US Border Patrol Academy um, students. What has emerged from these and many other evaluations of task-based language teaching is that there are a number of problems. And I'm listing here the problems. I'm, I'm going to just pause a minute and let you read through these problems because I'm actually going to kind of revisit them in the last part of my talk. So I'll just pause for a few seconds. Okay, problems. Um, it, it might seem that because I have listed all these problems about task-based language teaching, that, you know, why don't we go back to traditional teaching? Well, the reason we don't go back to traditional language teaching is it had even more problems. Not everybody likes TBLT though. And there have been some quite serious critiques of TBLT. Um, Littlewood, for example, argued that C, uh, CLT, including strong version of CLT, namely TBLT, is not suited to traditional language culture of learning, where education is conceived more as a process of knowledge accumu accumulation than as a process of using knowledge for immediate purposes, right? So he argued that there were cultural reasons why TBLT was not well suited to um, Asian countries. Other problems not possible with low proficiency students, some people have argued. Only feasible in an acquisition rich context. In other words, yes, we can do task based language teaching in an ESL environment, but we can't do it in an EFL environment. No grammar. People have argued there's no grammar in task-based language teaching. And there's no evidence that it's better than traditional structural approaches. Now, I don't have time to refute all of those uh, critiques. But in fact, I think there is plenty of evidence that none of them are really fully justified. You can use TBLT with low proficiency students. Um, I think it's actually of special value in an EFL context. There is grammar. There's grammar through focus on form and corrective feedback. And then there's grammar in the, the post stage of the lesson, the post task stage of the lesson. And there have been studies that have compared TBLT to more traditional types of language teaching with quite favorable results for task-based language teaching. Okay, um, I've got 15 minutes and I've reached now the last stage of my talk, which is to look at remaining questions. What is the way forward? I think the first thing is that we need to have a very clear definition of a task, right? Unless, unless there can be clear agreement on what a task is and what a task isn't, um, then I don't think that it is, there's any way forward with task-based language teaching. And this is where I draw again on the definition that I presented to you earlier. Uh, I think that it's possible to use my definition to actually evaluate different types of language teaching activities 
and decide whether they are a task or not a task, or maybe sometimes they have some task-like qualities, but they're not entirely tasks. So you can take those four criteria that I mentioned, and you can say, do they apply to a particular language teaching activity? And in this way, you can arrive at um, a, a clear idea of whether something is a task or is a not. And teachers have a lot of problems in trying to decide whether a particular type of language teaching activity is a task or is not a task. This really, this again, this again draws on points that I've made during my talk. Is a needs-based approach for identifying targets tasks appropriate for all learners? Remember, Long has argued that needs analysis is central to TBLT. In fact, Long in some of his recent publications goes so far to say that if there is no needs analysis, it's not TBLT. Well, if that's the case then, it seems to me that TBLT is not a possibility for uh, school, uh, state school systems in Asia. Um, I don't accept Long's position. I agree that where it's possible to do needs analysis and identify the target tasks that learners need to do, that we should do it. But if we are trying to develop task-based language teaching for state school systems, I think that we can't possibly do a needs analysis. But the selection of tasks must still be principled. Needs analysis does give us a very principled way of deciding what tasks to use. And I suggest that perhaps what we need is research regarding what topics, themes, social issues, students have an interest in. In other words, the basis for the task content in countries like Thailand should not be a needs analysis, at least in the state education system. It should be an analysis that looks at the topics and themes that will interest students, that will motivate students. If they're motivated to talk about these in Thai, then we can design tasks that will motivate them to talk about them in English. The third question, how can the problems of determining the complexity of tasks be resolved to ensure that learners at different levels of proficiency are faced with tasks that pose a reasonable challenge? This is dealing with the grading and sequencing of tasks, right? And of course, it all hangs on task complexity and how we can determine whether one task is more complex or less complex than another task. I've already mentioned that um, a set of criteria have been developed by Robinson to help us to try to evaluate task complexity. However, I'm not entirely convinced that it is possible to use those criteria in a scientific way to decide which task is complex, what is easier, etc. The reason is, is that tasks are very holistic. They are conglomerates of variables. They have many variables involved in their design, etc. And this really makes it impossible to systematically identify the individual variables that will create task difficulty. So I, my, my proposal is really a very simple one. We, sh we should get hold of uh, Robinson's ideas about uh, task complexity, and we should use them as a kind of checklist, but we should apply them in terms of our own intuition about what makes a task difficult or easy. In other words, I see Robinson's criteria as refining, improving 
our intuitive judgments about what is, what is a difficult task and what is an easier task. How can task-based teaching be made to work for beginner learners who have no or very little knowledge of L2? I hear this all the time. I can't do task-based language teaching with my learners. They don't know how to speak. My learners are complete beginners. How can I get them to do tasks, etc.? But in fact, it is possible. And this is where input-based tasks have a central role to play in task-based language teaching. Language learning starts with learning to comprehend, not learning to speak. Speaking follows on from the learning that takes place through comprehending input. That's a fundamental principle of both first language acquisition and second language acquisition. And therefore, what we need are input-based tasks. Uh, one of my PhD students, her name is Natsuko uh, Shintani, um, she devised a task-based course to teach to uh, students in a little private school um, in Nagoya in Japan. All the students were no any English. They were all six years old. So what she wanted to do is to show that you can do task-based language teaching with six-year-old complete beginners, and also to show that they are learning language. And what her PhD thesis was able to show was that they could do the tasks, they enjoy doing the tasks, and they did learn new language. In fact, they learn new language better than in a traditional approach because she had a comparison group where she taught them traditionally. Um, her book is actually, her thesis has been now published as a book published by John Men uh, Benjamin. A name again, Natsuko Shintani. What about focus tasks? Again, this is an area where there is disagreements. Long argues that there's no real need for any focus tasks at all. And this is because basically he says that all tasks should be based on target tasks, needs analysis. And the needs analysis doesn't focus on grammar. It focuses on target tasks. Um, I've argued, however, that focus tasks have a role, but not right at the beginning. I don't see any sense in using focus tasks at the beginning because learners are not really ready to learn grammar. How does language learning start? Language learning starts by understanding vocabulary, understanding formulaic expressions, and then slowly using the vocabulary and the formulaic expressions in order to say something. So I think all tasks should be unfocused, no, no grammar, no grammar focus. But maybe when they get to the intermediate stage and they are having problems with specific grammatical structures, maybe we could then introduce some unfocused tasks. Should teachers focus on form while students are performing tasks? Again, this is controversial. Willis says no. Uh, Long says yes, Ellis, me, I say yes. Um, there are two ways of course focusing on form. One can either do it immediately while the task is being performed or one can wait until after the task is being performed. But I don't think this is something that teachers need to make a choice about. I think they should be doing corrective feedback while the task is taking place, but equally, they can do focus on form in the post-task stage of the lesson. Teachers can do both. How can a focus on form be best incorporated into a task-based lesson? Oh, it would take me too long to go over this um, because there are different ways in which we could do it, right? Um, Perhaps the key distinction here 
is whether the focus on form should be explicit or implicit. So let me, let me give you a quick example um, using corrective feedback. Let's say a learner says, uh, last weekend, I go see movie. Now the teacher could reply very implicitly, oh, you went to see a movie last weekend, did you? Now the teacher is correcting, but in a very implicit way. All the teacher can do it more explicitly. Oh, you went to see a movie, did you? Emphasizing the word that was wrong, etc. And um, what research has tended to show is that by and large in classroom contexts, explicit feedback works a little bit better than implicit feedback. How can teachers be sure that students are developing language? I get this, you know, you, the teachers are worried that if they do tasks with students, they don't know whether they're learning anything. So how can they perhaps find out? One way is to repeat tasks, to see whether when they do a task later, they do it better when they, than whether they did it before. Perhaps also we could ask learners to keep a record of any new language that they came across while they were doing a task. And perhaps all, and also we could back up tasks performed in class with traditional types of learning activities that students can perform out of class. There are ways of dealing with this problem. What problems do teachers face with TBLT and how can these address? Confidence in their own uh, oral proficiency, teacher's confidence. Um, one of the points that has often been made when I talk about task-based language teaching in Japan is that the teachers are not confident in their oral English and therefore they can't do task-based language teaching. Well, I suppose really the answer is that if they're not confident in their oral language, probably they shouldn't be an English teacher, right? Um, but it is a problem. My, my, my main argument to this is that teachers have to stop worrying that the language that they model for their students is correct. They should approach tasks in the same way they want the students to approach tasks. That is to say, to find some way of expressing your meaning using whatever linguistic resources that you have at your disposal. Uh, and I think if teachers get rid of the idea that it doesn't matter in task-based language teaching if you're not always correct. Uh, another point I often make is that if these teachers with limited English proficiency have a go at doing task-based language teaching, it will not only be their students' proficiency that improves, it will be their own proficiency, that these teachers will be improving their English through actually performing the tasks. I'm sorry, I don't have time to deal with each of these other problems. It would be another talk too long. What kind of teacher training is needed to ensure uptake of TBLT by teachers? Um, and I think that this is an important question. And in some of my more recent articles, I've begun to actually talk about the kind of teacher training that I think they need. Uh, some general principles here. Teacher training programs should be task-based. Uh, again, not just lecture and listen, but getting students to, getting teachers to actually do tasks. Um, it's important to provide teachers with suitable task-based materials they can use in their classes. And it's important to go and visit the teacher in their schools so that you can provide support there. Oh, I make it absolutely one hour. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Ellis. This is a very comprehensive, comprehensive talk. And um, I didn't think that um, a task-based um, teaching and learning would be this multifaceted, okay? So I have learned a lot um, about different aspects of task-based pedagogy. 
okay? Um, not just only how to design it. We have to think about the, um, how to sequence it, right? And uh, oh, yeah. um, task complexity. Um, I got a chance to read the article that you mentioned, um, Robinson 2001. Um, that one was a good article. And I think um, participants, if you have a chance, um, you can um, read that. I think for um, English language teachers, um, if you know task complexity, right, we can design it better. We will know how much time our students might need, right, to uh, perform the task. And we also know how to grade them, how to sequence the task over the semester, okay? So um, everyone, we have around 25 minutes for Q&A, okay? As Professor Ellis, told us in the beginning of the talk that he will read um, the questions from the chat box by himself. So if you have any questions, please leave your questions in the group chat and then uh, Professor Ellis will um, select them and um, answer your questions. Right. You. So looking, before, before we move on to the Q&A, uh, I, need, I need to do some announcement, Professor Ellis, okay? Yeah, I also need to know how to get in the chat room because I I'm opening up the top and I can't see where it says chat room. And stop sharing your PowerPoint slides first. Can you click stop sharing? New share. Stop, stop video. Sharing your screen. Okay, and then uh, at the bottom of your screen, can you see chat? In the middle. Uh, now I can. Yeah. Okay. So uh, before Professor Ellis um, answers your questions that you leave in the um, group chat, um, I have some announcement. So after Q and A, we have two things to do. Okay. The first thing is group photos. Um, our team will take uh, a group photo of you. So if you are convenient, you can turn on your camera later. Okay. And the second thing is evaluation. So we need feedback from everyone, from all the participants. Uh, our team will share the slide to the QR code for feedback, okay? And um, please do feedback. If you want to um, get a certificate of attendance, the last page of the feedback, there will be the link to um, your certificate and you can just fill in your name, your email address, and uh, the certificate will be generated automatically and it will be sent to your email later, okay? So I think we have some questions now. Professor Ellis, you can- Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go from the top and work down. Okay. I think the first one is from Mr. F. Turka about um, the, the assessment? Well, there's a question. There's Is a question from great? Mary Grace Arigal. Yes. Uh, Arsigal to everyone. Yes. Yeah, this question, I'll, I'll, I'm sure people can see it, but let me just read it. What is your suggestion about teaching, making, teachers making more time in creating tasks to their class? How can you help teachers shift from traditional to using task-based approach? Some teachers will resort to using traditional since they also after teach they they also after teaching grammar. I want to apply this. Okay, I I I agree. This is a problem. If I if I um, paraphrase the problem. It is that teachers don't have tasks that they can go and use with their students and they don't have the time to make tasks, right? Um, so I, I need, I'm quite a practical person. And my belief is that if teachers are not used to task-based language teaching and they want to try to introduce it into their classrooms, they should not introduce a revolution in their classroom. They should not try to make a sudden switch from a more traditional approach to a task-based approach. But what they should do is to try to set aside maybe 15 minutes in a lesson 
where they can introduce a particular task. Now, this makes the whole idea of innovating with task-based language teaching more practical because one, they don't have to develop so many tasks. And two, they are not, they don't have to risk, and it is risky if you move from teaching one way to teaching another. So I would like to suggest that people try to introduce task-based language teaching into their class slowly, bit by bit, seeing how it goes, seeing if they can overcome the problems, etc. I hope that that gives you some ideas about that particular question. Okay, next one, assessment. Yes, this is, uh, this is perfectly true, that task-based language teaching um, would emphasize the importance of formative assessment. Formative assessment is the assessment that um, teachers actually do um, in their own classroom, ongoing throughout a course, etc. And um, the obvious way to do this is to take a look at how students are doing tasks and to what extent they are successful in doing tasks. Uh, again, input-based tasks are much more, much easier to use for formative assessment than production-based tasks. So if you want to start with task-based assessment and to use it formatively, I would suggest that you set aside a number of listening or maybe reading tasks where you can assess what the, stu the student's performance of the task in terms of whether they have achieved the outcome successfully. Like my map task, have they written in the names of all the places? I'm looking down now to another one. Designing tasks need time, freedom of teachers and assessment, what is not possible in some contexts. Well, I've actually really ad addressed that point. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend that you make a sudden switch from your normal way of teaching to task-based language teaching. What I would suggest is that you try to introduce tasks bit by bit into your teaching and evaluate them as you go along. Okay, this is Ria. Hi, Ria. Professor Ellis said that TPLT is not really for beginner level students. Mm -mm, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said the opposite. I said TBLT is for all students, including beginners. I talked about my, my students' um, PhD. Um, well, in of you a talk, yeah, you mentioned that, right? Maybe, yeah. Um, maybe she got yeah. it from the middle of the talk. Um, you mentioned like, you know, um, a series of um, factors or not factors. It's like things that people might be afraid of when they, they do TBLT. That's possible. But that was that's uh, possible. the proficiency. That's, that's possible. Yeah, maybe, maybe she put this question up. Uh, sorry, Ria, if you put it up early. Anyhow, how, I hope as the talk went on, you realize that I was definitely not saying that task-based language teaching is not possible with beginner level learners. It is, but it means using input-based tasks. Okay, next question is Farid from Indonesia. So actually, this is interesting. She, this question is about uh, Nasako Shintani's um, research, okay? Um, her, her actual research was carried out over nine lessons, right? Nine lessons. In those nine lessons, uh, she used two basic tasks. Um, and she repeated those two basic tasks nine times. She repeated the same task nine times. Now you might think, God, the, the students will get bored. 
but the students never got bored. They never got bored. Why didn't they get bored? Because initially they found the task very difficult to do. And as the tasks were repeated, so they got better and better and better at doing the tasks. So the students felt that they were learning. <laughs> um, really, nine times, nine times. Me and she actually, she actually asked them, you know, did you get fed up with it? I mean, she, 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 she interviewed them and, um, and, and asked them and they said, no, no, we enjoyed the tasks. They were always a challenge. The, the other reason is that when you repeat a task, you're repeating the task as work plan, but the task as process is not always the same. The task as process changes each time you repeat the task. So the way in which the teacher was performing the tasks with the students for the ninth time was entirely different from the way in which she performed it initially. When she performed initially, she did use some Japanese. And when the students didn't understand, they would ask questions in Japanese. But by the time you got to the ninth time, she was using no Japanese. And the students were not asking questions in Japanese. I hope that answers your question. So may I ask? I, 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 find, I find what she did uh, the most single impressive account of how task-based language teaching can be made to work with very young children who know no English. I find it an enormously impressive account. Uh, Professor Ellis, could you elaborate on that? This is quite interesting. Um, you said that the task was repeated nine times, right? So um, did your student also, um, also test the successful rate of the task over time? So did it increase or not, the outcome she, of the she, she did do She did do pre-tests. Well, the pre-tests, they didn't know anything. So basically the pre-tests were all zero. And then she did post-tests at the end of the five weeks after repeating the task nine times. And she tested mainly vocabulary because she wasn't interested in grammar. Oh, actually she did, she did test grammar a little bit as well. Uh, she, tested, um, she tested their ability to um, recognize plural, plural nouns and understand plural nouns, right? The interesting thing is that although the tasks were entirely input based. It didn't mean that the students did not try to say something either in Japanese and later on in English. They did. Input based tasks do not stop people from producing. They don't require students to produce. There's a fundamental difference in an activity that makes students have to produce as opposed to an activity that gives them an opportunity to produce. Actually, I've, I've seen in Indonesia uh, a task-based approach introduced with, with students. And the same thing went on there, that all the teacher was using input-based tasks. And so the students didn't have to produce, but they did, they tried. Sometimes in Indonesian, sometimes in English. So input-based tasks are a very, very powerful way of getting started with task-based language teaching with beginners, but even with more advanced learners, because input-based task teachers can control more. They can control the input that is part of the task, etc. Do you want to follow up with a question or shall I move on? Yes, please. Okay. I think the next one is about the retention of task-based teaching. Well, the answer to that question is yes. Do you think the information learned through task-based teaching will get a better chance to go into long-term memory? Yes. Yes. The reason is that the, the task-based language teaching is really catering to incidental implicit learning. 
It's not catering to intentional explicit learning. Now, when you learn something intentionally and explicitly, it's very easy to forget it. You all know this because you've all mugged up for examinations, done your examination, and then forgot all the stuff that you mugged up a month later, right? Yes, I agree. It's just like when you cram for your finals, right? The That's night it. before the finals, and then yeah. the, the following day, you just forget everything. <laughs> yeah. So no retention yeah. there, but yeah, yeah. It, it's more incidental. You tend to... The incidental, the, the process of learning incidentally, implicitly, is much more likely to last in your, in, in your long-term memory, okay? Um, you never, you never forget your L1. You know, there are people that learned their L1 as children, but then went to live in another country and learned the language of the other country, which became their main language, right? And yes, there is some decline in their knowledge of their L1, but interestingly, never complete decline. They always remember and they can always communicate in their L1, right? You could, and I'm talking about, it could be 30, 40, 50 years since you left the country where you learned your L1, right? So that is really long-term. And the reason is because when you learn your L1, you learn it implicitly. Mum does not teach you grammar. Mum does not give you lists of words to learn. Mom simply communicates with you. She does tasks with you, right? Playing games with you, cooking with you. She does tasks with you. And that's why we never really forget our L1, even if we've stopped using it for a long time. Yeah, that's why we call it mother tongue. <laughs> that's why we call it mother tongue. Okay, so we can move on. Okay. Let me move the screen down a bit. Oh, let me do it this way. So we have a question at 306 by Matthew Noble. Yeah. Okay. I'm, at, I'm just reading his question now. Yeah, this, this, this really has to do with uh, um, task selection. And it's to do with my point where I suggested that in an EFL environment like Thailand, most students don't have any real language needs, target language needs. And therefore it doesn't make sense to try to do a needs analysis. So we've got to do something else instead. And the something else instead is to try to identify what are the topics, what are the issues, what are the, the themes that they want to talk about in their, in their Thai world, etc. And then we get them. I, to I really like this point a lot that you mentioned because uh, for needs analysis, sometimes you don't really know what careers they will have, right? For example, if you create a course that has so many students, right? So they're going to do, um, they're going to have different professions uh, after graduation. So yeah. the point that you mentioned that uh, we can do needs analysis, but we um, might want to know what kind of topics or themes they, they are interested in, like common topics. So I think that's, that's more plausible. Right. I'm just going back to uh, Matthew's comment here. Uh, I'm not quite clear what his point is. Uh, I mean, what, what, what I'm really arguing is that we find out what are the real issues that your students want to talk about that motivates them, what interests them, what are their themes, etc. And then we develop tasks around those topics, around those themes. And then we use those tasks uh, in our English lessons. 
Um, the rationale for this is that if they are interested in talking about them in Thai, that there's a reasonable chance that providing we don't make the task too complex, that we can help them to actually try to talk about these themes, these topics in English, right? Um, I, I think that um, he meant that sometimes students want to talk about certain things, but they want to use the L1 in talking about that or in doing a task. But you also mentioned that there's uh, the, 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 the idea of uh, quality input, um, I mean the language yeah. input, right? Yeah. That needs to be in the target language. Yeah. So how can we compromise this? Because sometimes we really want to have them do a task that they are interested in, but it's in their L1. But at the same time, we also need them to get the quality input in the target language as well. Well, well this again is why input-based tasks are so powerful. Because, you know, if, if you're introducing an, an, a new theme and you want your students to be able to communicate um, about that theme, the starting point is not to thrust them into a speaking task. The starting point is to devise input-based tasks that make them process input relevant to the theme. And you might need to have quite a few input-based tasks before you um, introduce um, um, a production task, a speaking task, right? So I think the way to overcome that is again through input-based tasks. But you know, um, if students are interested in a particular theme or topic, and it's a production task, yes, they are going to use their L1, right? But again, maybe here, you know, task repetition comes in. Maybe if you see that they're using the L1 too much, you stop the production task and go back to some input tasks on the same theme. And then you repeat the production task later on, right? I think there are strategies where it is possible to gradually introduce students into performing production tasks about interesting themes and getting them to try to do it in English, right? And I just suggested two strategies. One is using input-based tasks, and the other, again, is task repetition. Okay, so we have five more minutes for the questions. Okay, we have indeed. Darren. Uh, Darren, what do you want? Do you want a theoretical book? Or do you want a sort of practical how to do it book? All right, I'll, I'll answer both. If you want a theoretical book, then uh, Cambridge University Press have just published uh, a book on task-based language teaching um, by myself and Peter Skeen and three other authors. This was published right at the beginning of this year. So if you, if you want the theoretical background to it, then I suggest you get that book, okay? Um, it's by Ellis et al. Um, I think it's called Task-Based Language Teaching Theory and Practice, but it's more about theory than practice. And um, if you want a sort of how to do it, I published um, a, a little introduction to task-based language teaching, basically um, explaining what it was and how to do it, et cetera, with lots of examples. And this has been published twice, actually, it was published in Indonesia. I can't remember the name of the Indonesian public publishing house now. And it was also published in China by Shanghai Foreign Language Education Press. And it's simply called Introducing Task-Based Language Teaching, right? Um, so you should be able to locate copies of that, although because it's not a main publisher, it might be a little, a, a little difficult, right? Um, but that is a very, very practical account 
of um, how, how to do task-based language teaching. And if, if, if you're a newcomer to it, I would start with the practical how to do it. And then if you're sufficiently interested, you go and have a look at the theory, right? I, I never really think that theory has to precede practical considerations. I think that it's very often important to prioritize practice and then turn to theory later on. Okay, so uh, we have three more minutes. Maybe okay. we can cover two more questions. Okay. Well, thank you for thanking me. I'm glad you found it interesting. Oh, that's a big question. A cognitively based activity sequencing pattern with task-based language teaching. I don't think, I think Robinson's work is the work that you should go and look at in order to see that, right? Although I made the point that by and large, I don't think it's possible to develop a totally scientific cognitively based activity sequencing, right? I don't think it's possible. I think it's useful to have such a model, such a theory available, but ultimately I think teachers have to apply intuition. So I've argued that they use Robinson's ideas, right, to sharpen their own intuitive ability to think about what works with their classes at different times. Okay, so this will be the last question. Okay. Uh, how can we actually assess the integrity of the performance of the task in an, oh, well, <laughs> Again, you know, um, if you're going to use input-based tasks like the map task, uh, it's, it's fairly easy because basically you have to have some computer system that would record the student's uh, response where they, put the, uh, where, where, where they put all the different places on the map and labeled them correctly, etc. They, they would have to record it and then just send it to you afterwards much more difficult with speaking, but then it's very difficult to actually assess speaking um, formatively, uh, even in a classroom. I mean, there's, there's one strong point that is coming out of my talk, right? And it is this, that if you want to get started on task-based assessment, if you want to get started on task-based language teaching, input-based tasks. Because input-based tasks, you can design them so that there is a definite closed outcome, and then you can look to see whether a student has achieved that closed outcome. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we are so sorry that we don't have time to cover, accommodate all the questions.